So I tried this novel thing, and I've been working on it since it starts, so I'm going to read you a fit on it. <laughs> the quiet of a library is thick. So much wood, shelves, desks, and ornamental details, all polished to a soft gleam. Scholars' feet swinging absentmindedly, brushing back and forth, wearing glossy furrows into the floor like pendulums, ticking out measures of information, touching the pages of old letters, books, and manuscripts with gentleness and reverence, knowing that this page is unique. No other copy is imbued with the same history, the same fibers, or dust, or shape on them. My eight-year-old daughter likes me to read from her from books about princesses, ancient kingdoms, and lands that hide in mists. Because she's still at that age where everything is in its equal measure of believability or unbelievability, she has no problem reconciling. It's all just one incredible adventure. But when she does ask, Daddy, can we go rescue a princess? And wants to know where the princess lives, my answer is not one that all parents would approve. I too believe in those magic kingdoms. I understand that once what did and did not exist on the face of the planet was much more subjective. Way before there were satellite images of every square inch and Google Earth could peer into people's windows. Before that, it was all just hearsay. A place existed because someone claimed to have seen it. A bard would travel from village to village and tell stories of where he'd been, of animals he'd seen, he might share stories of the people who inhabit another village, complete strangers, and yet their cares and foibles so familiar to the listener. The first maps were made a long, long time ago. I wish I could see them. What did the world look like to those early map makers? Did they realize that their art changed the world? Because once a place is mapped, it becomes fixed in a man's consciousness. It exists because it is said to exist. It is recorded on paper. The only regular noise comes from my restless feet and the footsteps of someone else on the floor five or six stacks over. In the distance, an occasional cough or rustle as someone struggles to turn a stuck page. I turn into a row and start looking at a shelf of Polynesian history. The books look undisturbed. I don't often browse the general history section. Mostly my books come from the coffers below the library. I fill out a slip and submit it, and my identification to a librarian who transfers the information to another form, and depending on the library, either disappears through a door or picks up a slick black receiver and whispers into it like ordering an assassination, and I wait patiently. When I finish up here and go to the counter to request my books, the forged card of a panel librarian at steamed library will read, Theodore Davis, PhD. Am I a thief? Most of the time, I'm just a scholar, but when I'm finished with my research and start engaging in business, I prefer the term reacquisitioner of antiquarian goods. <laughs> it's an honest title, but pretentious enough to slow down conversations. <laughs> and I'm not by any means a professional forger. My papers would never withstand the most cursory document inspection, never mind scans and lasers and other new high-tech devices. This is what makes things more urgent. The library is about to switch over, and I may not have another chance. I need to stay, to stay just ahead of the tide, out swimming technology before it makes what I do so much more difficult, and yet that much more valuable, so much more worth the effort. Do you need gloves? The librarian asks, holding out a pair of cheap ones, slightly baggy and stained like old underwear. <laughs> no, I have my own. I pat my jacket pocket like a heartbeat loud enough for her to hear the gesture, but not my nervousness. The book had arrived in a large plastic tray with tall sides, so it wouldn't slide out of the bare trip or something. The tall sides were also like the stones of a fortress, discouraging penetration. Like sets, the handling of these old books is ritualistic. The oils of the hand can ruin paper as quickly as water. The antiquarian room of the library is a sealed environment, carefully kept at a constant temperature. The librarian explains the procedures for borrowing the books gently, almost a Marilyn in a whisper, like she is talking to her child. There is no suspicion or malice in her voice. You have 20 minutes with this book. No pens or food or water. You can only use a passage to take notes. This wasn't the first time she said this to me. 
nor, of course, the last time she would say it to someone today. And she had every reason to assume she would repeat the lines to me again and again and again. She used her ringless left hand to push the book towards me. I am researching the Papua New Guinea tribesmen. This library was gifted with a collection that belonged to an eminent Victorian biologist who, as the story tells it, lost his entire family on that faded Titanic voyage. I have been through piles of his notebooks, and after all this time have developed a true interest for the objects of his study. I am moved by his urge to discover and chart, in a sense to, cre excuse me, to create, because in the Victorian mind, those tribesmen and their lands did not exist until mapped, recorded, and studied. The Victorian was a maker of maps and means to an end. His pages are crammed with scrawling ribbons of marginalia, indicating that for him, this was a living document, and who knows if he ever intended it to be transcribed and published. But someone eventually did set his research to type and printed off a few thousand copies, which made their way into libraries, private and public across the world. Upstairs in the general history section, there was one I could have easily slipped off the shelves if I was only interested in writing. My cutting, my cutting tool is like a shiv, and just as deadly. I steal the map without damaging the book by carefully sliding a piece of plastic underneath before I cut. I have practiced this in front of mirrors and cameras so that unless someone was standing directly over me, no one would recognize the gestures of theft. Mm -hmm. Thank you.